The Pentagon is the world's largest office building, 6.5 million square feet. 30,000 people, more than 17 miles of corridors, but it was built with just three street doors, each one of them opening into a guarded pedestrian lobby. I chose the southeast option, the main concourse entrance, the one nearest the metro and the bus station because it was the busiest and the most popular with civilian workers, and I wanted plenty of civilian workers around, preferably a whole long unending stream of them, for insurance purposes, mostly against getting shot on sight. Arrests go bad all the time, sometimes accidentally, sometimes on purpose, so I wanted witnesses. I wanted independent eyeballs on me, at least at the beginning. I remember the date, of course. It was Tuesday, the 11th of March, 1997, and it was the last day I walked into that place. As a legal employee of the people who built it, a long time ago, the 11th of March 1997 was also by chance exactly four and a half years before the world changed, on that other future Tuesday, and so like a lot of things in the old days the Security at the main concourse entrance was serious without being hysterical. Not that I invited hysteria, not from a distance. I was wearing my Class A uniform, all of it clean, pressed, polished, and spit shined, all of it covered with 13 years worth of metal, ribbons, badges, insignia, and citations. I was 36 years old, standing tall and walking ramrod straight a totally squared away U.S. Army military police major in every respect, except that my hair was too long and I hadn't shaved for five days. Back then Pentagon security was run by the Defense Protective Service, and from 40 yards I saw 10 of their guys in the lobby, which I thought was far too many, which made me wonder whether they were all theirs or whether some of them were actually ours. Working undercover waiting for me. Most of our skilled work is done by warrant officers, and they do a lot of it by pretending to be someone else. They impersonate colonels and generals and enlisted men, and anyone else they need to, and they're good at it, all in a day's work for them to throw on DPS uniforms and wait for their target. From 30 yards I didn't recognize any of them, but then, the army is a very big institution, and they would have chosen men I had never met before. I walked on, part of a broad wash of people heading across the concourse to the doors. Some men and women in uniform, either class is like my own or the old woodland. Pattern BDUs we had back then, and some men and women obviously military but out of uniform, in suits or work clothes, and some obvious civilians, some of each category. Carrying bags or briefcases or packages, all of each category slowing and sidestepping and shuffling as the broad wash of people narrowed to a tight arrowhead and then narrowed further still to lonely single file or collegial two by two, as folks got ready to stream. Inside, I lined up with them, on my own, single file, behind a woman with pale unworn hands and ahead of a guy in a suit that had gone shiny at the elbows. Civilians, both of them, desk workers, probably analysts of some kind, which was exactly what I wanted. Independent eyeballs. It was close to noon. There was sun in the sky and the March air. Had a little warmth in it. Spring, in Virginia. Across the river the cherry trees were about to wake up. The famous blossom was about to break out. All over the innocent nation airline. Tickets and SLR cameras lay on hall tables, ready for sightseeing trips to the capital. I waited in line. Way ahead of me the DPS guys were doing what security guys do. Four of them were occupied with specific tasks, two, manning an inquiry counter and two, checking official badge holders and then waving them through an open turnstile. Two, were standing directly behind the glass inside the doors, looking out heads high, eyes front, scanning the approaching crowd. Four were hanging back in the shadows behind the turnstiles, 
just clumped together, shooting the shit. All ten were armed. It was the four behind the turnstiles that worried me. No question that back in 1997 the Department of Defense was seriously puffed up and overmanned in relation to the threats. We faced then, but even so it was unusual to see four on-duty guys with absolutely nothing to do. Most commands at least made their surplus personnel look busy. But these four had no obvious role. I stretched up tall and peered ahead and tried to get a look at their shoes. You can learn a lot from shoes. Undercover disguises often don't get that far, especially in a uniformed environment. The DPS was basically a beat cop role, so to the extent that a choice was available, DPS guys would go for cop shoes, big comfortable things. Appropriate for walking and standing all day. Undercover MP warrant officers might use their own shoes, which would be subtly different. But I couldn't see their shoes. It was too dark inside, and too far away. The line shuffled along, at a decent pre-9-11 clip. No sullen impatience, no frustration, no fear. Just old-style routine. The woman in front of me was wearing perfume. I could smell it coming off the nape of her neck. I liked it. The two guys behind the glass noticed. Me about ten yards out. Their gaze moved off the woman and onto me. It rested on me a beat longer than it needed to, and then it moved on to the guy behind. Then it came back. Both men looked me over quite openly, up and down, side to side. Four or five seconds, and then I shuffled forward and their attention moved behind me. Again, they didn't say anything to each other. Didn't say anything to anyone else, either. No warnings, no alerts. Two possible interpretations. One, best case, I was just a guy they hadn't seen before, or maybe I stood out because I was bigger and taller than anyone. Within a hundred yards, or because I was wearing a major's gold oak leaves and ribbons. For some heavy-duty medals, including a silver star, like a real poster boy, but because of the hair and the beard I also looked like a real caveman, which visual dissonance might have been enough reason for the long second glance, just purely out of interest. Sentry. Duty can be boring, and unusual sights are always welcome. Or two, worst case, they were merely confirming to themselves that some expected event had indeed happened, and that all was going according to plan. Like they had prepared and studied photographs and were saying to themselves, okay, he's here, right on. Time. So now we just wait two more minutes until he steps inside, and then we take him down. Because I was expected, and I was right on time. I had a 12 o'clock appointment and matters to discuss with a particular colonel in a third floor office in the C ring, and I was certain I would never get there. To walk head on into a hard arrest was a pretty blunt tactic, but sometimes if you want to know for sure whether the stove is hot, the only way to find out is to touch it. The guy ahead of the woman ahead of me stepped inside the doors and held up a badge that was attached to his neck by a lanyard. He was waved onward. The woman in front of me moved and then stopped short, because right at that moment the two DPS watchers chose to come out from behind the glass. The woman paused in place and let them squeeze out in front of her, against the pressing flow. Then she resumed her progress and stepped inside, and the two guys stopped and stood exactly where she had been, three feet in front of me but facing in the opposite direction, toward me, not away from me. They were blocking the door. They were looking right at me. I was pretty sure they were. Genuine DPS personnel. They were wearing cop shoes, and their uniforms had eased in. Stretched and molded themselves to their individual physiques over a long period of time. These were not disguises, snatched from a locker and put on for the first time that. Morning. I looked beyond the two guys, inside, at their four partners who were doing nothing, 
and I tried to judge the fit of their clothes, by way of comparison. It was hard to, tell, in front of me the guy on my right said, Sir, may we help you? I asked, with what? Where are you headed today? Do I need to tell you that? No sir, absolutely not, the guy said. But we could speed you along a little, if you, like, probably via an inconspicuous door into a small locked room, I thought. I figured they, had civilian witnesses on their mind too, the same way I did. I said, I'm happy to wait my, turn, I'm almost there, anyway. The two guys said nothing in reply to that, stalemate, amateur hour, to try to start the, arrest outside was dumb, I could push and shove and turn and run and be lost in the crowd, in the blink of an eye, and they wouldn't shoot, not outside, there were too many people, on the concourse, too much collateral damage, this was 1997, remember, March, 11th. Four and a half years before the new rules. Much better to wait until I was inside. The lobby. The two stooges could close the doors behind me and form up shoulder to shoulder in front of them while I was getting the bad news at the desk. At that point, theoretically I could turn back and fight my way past them again, but it would take me a second or two, and in that second or two the four guys with nothing to do could shoot me in the back about a thousand times. And if I charged forward they could shoot me in the front. And where would I go? Anyway, to escape into the Pentagon was no kind of a good idea. The world's largest office building, 30,000 people, five floors, two basements, 17 miles of corridors. There are 10 radial hallways between the rings, and they say a person can make it between any two random points inside a maximum seven minutes, which was presumably calculated with reference to the Army's official quick march pace of four miles an hour, which meant if I was running hard I could be anywhere within about three minutes. But where? I could find a broom closet and steal bag lunches and hold out a day or two, but that would be all. Or I could take hostages and try to argue my case, but I had never seen that kind of thing succeed. So I waited. The DPS guy in front of me on my right said, Sir, you be sure and have a nice day. Now, and then he moved past me, and his partner moved past me on my other side, both of them just strolling slow, two guys happy to be out in the air, patrolling, varying their viewpoint. Maybe not so dumb after all. They were doing their jobs and following their plan. They had tried to decoy me into a small locked room, but they had failed, no harm. No foul. So now they were turning the page straight to plan B. They would wait until I was inside and the doors were closed, and then they would jump into crowd control mode. Dispersing the incoming people, keeping them safe in case shots had to be fired inside. I assumed the lobby glass was supposed to be bulletproof, but the smart money never bets on the DoD having gotten exactly what it paid for. The door was right in front of me. It was open. I took a breath and stepped into the lobby. Sometimes if you want to know for sure whether the stove is hot, the only way to find out is to touch it. Chapter 2. The woman with the perfume and the pale hands was already deep into the corridor. Beyond the open turnstile, she had been waved through. Straight ahead of me was the two. Man inquiry desk. To my left were the two guys checking badges. The open turnstile was between their hips. The four spare guys were still doing nothing beyond it. They were still clustered together, quiet and watchful like an independent team. I still couldn't see their shoes. I took another breath and stepped up to the counter, like a lamb to the slaughter. The desk guy on the left looked at me and said, yes, sir. Fatigue and resignation in his voice, a response, not a question, as if I had already spoken. He looked young and reasonably smart, genuine DPS, presumably. 
MP warrant officers are quick studies, but they wouldn't be running a Pentagon inquiry desk, however deeply under they were supposed to be. The desk guy looked at me again, expectantly, and I said, I have a 12 o'clock appointment. Who with? Colonel Fraser, I said. The guy made out like he didn't recognize the name. The world's largest office building. 30,000 people. He leafed through a book the size of a telephone directory and asked, would that be Colonel John James Fraser? Senate liaison. I said, yes, or guilty as charged. Way to my left the four spare guys were watching me, but not moving. Yet, the guy at the desk didn't ask my name, partly because he had been briefed, presumably, and shown photographs, and partly because my Class A uniform included my name on a nameplate, worn as per regulations on my right breast pocket flap, exactly centered, its upper edge exactly a quarter of an inch below the top seam. Seven letters, Reacher, or, eleven letters, arrest me now. The guy at the inquiry desk said, Colonel John James Fraser is in 3C315. You know how to get there. I said, yes, third floor, C ring, nearest to radial corridor number 3, bay number 15. The Pentagon's version of map coordinates, which it needed, given that it covered 29 whole acres of floor space. The guy said, sir, you have a great day and his guileless gaze moved past my shoulder to the next in line. I stood still for a moment. They were tying it up with a bow. They were making it perfect. The general common law test for criminal culpability is expressed by the Latin actus non facet rum nisi mens sit re, which means, roughly, doing. Things won't necessarily get you in trouble unless you actually mean to do them. Action plus intention is the standard. They were waiting for me to prove my intention. They were waiting for me to step through the turnstile and into the labyrinth. Which explained why the four spare guys were on their side of the gate, not mine. Crossing the line would make it real. Maybe there were jurisdiction issues. Maybe lawyers had been consulted. Fraser wanted my ass gone for sure but he wanted his own ass covered just as much. I took another breath and crossed the line and made it real. I walked between the two badge checkers and squeezed between the cold alloy flanks of the turnstile. The bar was retracted. There was nothing to hit with my thighs. I stepped out on the far side and paused. The four spare guys were on my right. I looked at their shoes. Army regulations are surprisingly vague about shoes. Plain black lace-up Oxfords are close equivalents. Conservative, no designs on them, minimum of three pairs of eyelets, closed toe. Maximum two-inch heel, that's all the fine print says. The four guys on my right were all in compliance, but they weren't wearing cop shoes. Not like the two guys outside. They were sporting four variations on the same classic theme, high shines, tight laces, a little, creasing and wear here and there. Maybe they were genuine DPS. Maybe they weren't. No, way of telling. Not right then. I was looking at them, and they were looking at me, but no one spoke. I looped around, them and headed deeper into the building. I used the E-ring counterclockwise and turned, left at the first radial hallway. The four guys followed. They stayed about 60 feet behind me, close enough to keep me in sight, far enough. Back not to crowd me. A maximum seven minutes between any two points. I was the meat, in a sandwich. I figured there would be another crew waiting outside 3C315, or as close to it as they decided to let me get. I was heading straight for them. Nowhere to run, nowhere. To hide, I used some stairs on the D ring and went up two flights to the third floor. I changed to a clockwise direction, just for the fun of it, and passed radial corridor number five, and then four. The D ring was busy. 
People were bustling from place to place with armfuls of khaki. Files. Blank-eyed men and women in uniform were stepping smartly. The place was congested. I dodged and sidestepped and kept on going. People looked at me every step of the way, the hair, and the beard. I stopped at a water fountain and bent down and took a drink. People passed me by. Sixty feet behind me the four spare DPS guys were nowhere to be seen. But then, they didn't really need to tail me. They knew where I was going, and they knew what time I was supposed to get there. I straightened up and got going again and turned right into radial number three. I made it to the sea ring. The air smelled of uniform wool and linoleum polish and very faintly of cigars. The paint on the walls was thick and institutional. I looked left and right. There were people in the corridor, but no big cluster outside Bay 15. Maybe they were waiting for me inside. I was already five minutes late. I didn't turn. I stuck with radial 3 and walked all the way across the B ring to the A ring, the heart of the building, where the radial corridors finish or start, depending on your rank and perspective. Beyond the A ring is nothing but a five acre pentagonal open courtyard, like the hole in an angular donut. Back in the day, people called it ground zero because they figured the Soviets had their biggest and best missile permanently targeted on it, like a big fat bull's eye. I think they were wrong. I think the Soviets had their five biggest and best missiles targeted on it, just in case strikes one through four didn't work. The smart money says the Soviets didn't always get what they paid for. Either, I waited in the A ring until I was ten minutes late. Better to keep them guessing. Maybe, they were already searching. Maybe the four spare guys were already getting their butts. Kicked for losing me. I took another big breath and pushed off a wall and tracked back. Along radial three, across the B ring, to the C. I turned without breaking stride and headed. For Bay 15. Chapter. 3. There was no one waiting outside Bay 15. No special crew no one at all the corridor was entirely empty two both ways as far as the eye could see and quiet i guessed everyone else was already where they wanted to be 12 o'clock meetings were in full swing bay 15's door was open i knocked on it once as a courtesy as an announcement as a warning and then i stepped inside Originally most of the Pentagon's office space was open plan, boxed off by file cabinets and furniture into bays, hence the name, but over the years walls had gone up and private spaces had been created. Fraser's billet in 3C315 was pretty typical. It was a small square space with a window without a view, and a rug on the floor, and photographs on the walls, and a metal DOD desk and a chair with arms and two without, and a credenza and a double wide storage unit. And it was a small square space entirely empty of people, apart from Fraser himself in the chair behind the desk. He looked up at me and smiled. He said, hello, Reacher. I looked left and right. No one there. No one at all. There was no private bathroom. No. Large closet. No other door of any kind. The corridor behind me was empty. The giant building was quiet. Fraser said, close the door. I closed the door. Fraser said, sit down, if you like. I sat down. Fraser said, you're late. I apologize, I said. I got hung up. Fraser nodded. This place is a nightmare at 12 o'clock. Lunch breaks, shift, changes, you name it. It's a zoo. I never plan to go anywhere at 12 o'clock. I just hunker down in here. He was about 5'10", maybe 200 pounds, wide in the shoulders, solid through the chest, red-faced, black-haired, in his middle 40s. Plenty of old Scottish blood in his veins, filtered through the rich earth of Tennessee, which was where he was from. 
He had been in Vietnam as a teenager and the Gulf as an older man. He had combat pips all over him like a rash. He was an old-fashioned warrior, but, unfortunately for him he could talk and smile as well as he could fight, so he had been posted to Senate liaison, because the guys with the purse strings were now the real enemy. He said, so what have you got for me? I said nothing. I had nothing to say. I hadn't expected to get that far. He said, good news, I hope. No news, I said. Nothing. I nodded. Nothing. You told me you had the name. That's what your message said. I don't have the name. Then why say so? Why ask to see me? I paused a beat. It was a shortcut, I said. In what way? I put it around that I had the name. I wondered who might crawl out from under a rock. To shut me up. And no one has. Not so far. But ten minutes ago I thought it was a different story. There were four spare. Men in the lobby. In DPS uniforms. They followed me. I thought they were an arrest. Team. Followed you where? Around the E ring to the D. Then I lost them on the stairs. Fraser smiled again. You're paranoid, he said. You didn't lose them. I told you, there are shift changes at 12 o'clock. They come in on the metro like everyone else. They shoot the shit for a minute or two, and then they head for their squad room. It's on the B ring. They weren't following you. I said nothing. He said, there are always groups of them hanging around. There are always groups of everyone hanging around. We're seriously overmanned. Something is going to have to be done. It's inevitable. That's all I hear about on the hill, all day, every day. There's nothing we can do to stop it. We should all bear that in mind. People like you, especially like me, I said. There are lots of majors in this man's army. Too many, probably. Lots of colonels too, I said. Fewer colonels than majors. I said nothing. He asked, was I on your list of things that might crawl out from under a rock? You were the list, I thought. He said, was I? No, I lied. He smiled again. Good answer. If I had a beef with you, I'd have you killed down there. In Mississippi. Maybe I'd come on down and take care of it myself. I said nothing. He looked at me for a moment, and then a smile started on his face, and the smile turned into a laugh, which he tried very hard to suppress, but he couldn't. It came out like a bark, like a sneeze, and he had to lean back and look up at the ceiling. I said, what? His gaze came back level. He was still smiling. He said, I'm sorry. I was thinking about that phrase people use. You know, they say, that guy. He couldn't even get arrested. I said nothing. He said, you look terrible. There are barber shops here, you know. You should go use one. I can't, I said. I'm supposed to look like this. Five days earlier my hair had been five days shorter, but apparently still long enough to attract attention. Leon Garber, who at that point was once again my commanding officer, summoned me to his office, and because his message read in part without, repeat, without attending to any matters of personal grooming I figured he wanted to strike while the iron was hot and dress me down right then, while the evidence was still in existence, right there, on my head, and that was exactly how the meeting started out. He asked me, which army regulation covers a soldier's personal appearance, which I thought was a pretty rich question, coming from him. Garber was without a doubt the scruffiest officer I had ever seen. He could take a brand new class A coat from the quartermaster's stores and an hour later it would look like he had fought two wars in it, then slept in it, then survived three bars fights in it. I said, I can't remember which regulation covers a soldier's personal appearance. He said, neither can I, but I seem to recall that whichever, the hair and the fingernail. Standards and the grooming policies are in chapter 1, section 8. I can picture it all. 
quite clearly, right there on the page. Can you remember what it says? I said, no, it tells us that hair grooming standards are necessary to maintain uniformity within a military population. Understood. It mandates those standards. Do you know what they are? I've been very busy, I said. I just got back from Korea. I heard Japan. That was a stopover on the way. How long? 12 hours. Do they have barbers in Japan? I'm sure they do. Do Japanese barbers take more than 12 hours to cut a man's hair? I'm sure they don't. Chapter 1, Section 8, Paragraph 2 says the hair on the top of the head must be neatly groomed, and that the length and the bulk of the hair may not be excessive or present a ragged, unkempt, or extreme appearance. It says that instead, the hair must present a tapered appearance. I said, I'm not sure what that means. It says a tapered appearance is one where the outline of the soldier's hair conforms to the shape of his head, curving inward to a natural termination point at the base of his neck. I said, I'll get it taken care of. These are mandates, you understand. Not suggestions. Okay, I said. Section 2 says that when the hair is combed, it will not fall over the ears or the eyebrows, and it will not touch the collar. Okay, I said again. Would you not describe your current hairstyle as ragged, unkempt, or extreme. Compared to what? And how are you doing in relation to the thing with the comb and the ears and the eyebrows and the collar? I'll get it taken care of, I said again. Then Garber smiled, and the tone of the meeting changed completely. He asked, how fast does your hair grow, anyway? I don't know, I said. A normal kind of speed, I suppose. Same as anyone else, probably. Why, we have a problem, he said, down in Mississippi.